Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet. This is episode 64 of Registry Matters. Larry, it's hot here. It's like in the 70s. It's silly. We're not having that problem. Really? And I guess we could ask Josh if he's having like negative 100 or whatever it was up there. <laughs> it's not quite that bad here, but it is a little bit dippy. Storms blowing in, so they say. Apparently, uh, people out there on the interwebs really like having Josh on the podcast. Is that right? Well, maybe we yes. should have him uh, replace me, and then I won't have to get up and do this on Saturday. We could do that if you, if you are so inclined. I don't know, man. We might get a uh, an uprising of people burning down the uh, the castle gates if you try and uh, jump ship. <laughs> so. Well, I'll hang in here for another week. All right, cool. So, all right. So anybody out there, Larry's, Larry's quitting next week. Send all your emails to Larry at. <laughs> at crackpot.org. Right, 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 right. How's your new car? Well, it's running. Is it? Have, uh, and and you're, you're okay with parking it now? I haven't, uh, haven't rammed anything yet. <laughs> it's a tiny little car. I'm sure whatever you hit would not notice. Did you get a smart car? What is a smart car? It is slightly larger than a a a, a basketball player's shoe. No, I didn't. It is a ridiculously small car. It is literally it's a two seat car, and the front wheels are at your feet, and the rear wheels are at your butt. Oh, I, my car is not quite that small. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get this show on the road. Let's do it. All right. We got a question from uh, a Patreon supporter, Mike in Florida. And this goes to, this is a really complicated issue and I totally understand where he's coming from. It's, and his question is about the uh, sixth circuit, which we've covered for, I don't know, like the last four episodes. Uh, Jeff originally asked the question about the sixth circuit decision, but Mike says, I'm a little confused here. If the sixth district covers Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, wouldn't all of those states be liable to make similar changes to its registry the same as Michigan will most likely have to? Can you please explain how, in your opinion, the different states in that district would respond or react to whatever changes are made in Michigan? Would they possibly follow? As always, I love the podcast. I'm a Patreon supporter. Can you please talk about it on some podcast in the future, if possible? I'm still here in Florida, but I have immediate family in Kentucky and may consider moving if it changes for, excuse me, if it changes for the better, please keep up the great work. You are my favorite podcast of all time. You are probably the most important thing I listen to all week. You guys rock. Mike, thank you very much for all that. That is a, a very heartfelt and uh, makes me all squishy inside. Does your heart palpitate? I am, man. I'm all here. I'm kind of like getting a little bit of a sweat and uh, it gets, I, I don't know. I just feel good inside. I got some tingles. Well, we've always been taught that for every person that contacts you, there are a lot more that feel the same and don't take the time to bother, particularly with a positive comment. Uh, you get you tend to get more negative comments. So I'm hoping that's an indicator that other people feel similar, but we do appreciate Probably. it. Yep. Uh, it's a lot of good, good questions buried in here. And I would start by clarifying that when we're talking about the six, we're actually talking about the sixth circuit. The, the the appellate level federal courts are referred to as circuits. The uh, the trial level, those are districts. Uh, so it's the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And wouldn't those states be liable to make similar changes to the registry? Potentially. But what we have to remember is that all laws are presumed constitutional until they're decided to the contrary. They, they enjoy that presumption. So Ohio's law continues to be presumed constitutional. Kentucky's presu is presumed to be constitutional. And Tennessee's is presumed to be constitutional until a, a, a challenging party proves shows by the, the clearest of proof that it's not. This Sixth Circuit decision would give them what we call to, as, as, as presidential authority to make the argument. But we cannot assume that it would automatically work because the registries are not the same in those states. You would have to look at what tipped the circuit finding in favor, which were the 2006 and 2011 amendments that, that Michigan adopted. Do you have the same thing in Kentucky? 
did they did they soup up their registry in 2006 and 2011 or in any year using the exact same language of the Michigan statute with the same prohibitions, which which the court found very troubling, which was the proximity restrictions, the residency restrictions, and then the increasing the duration of registration. It 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 might be that those other states uh, have 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 the potential for their registries to be attacked with a valid challenge. But second, can uh, are are the states going to uh, feel compelled? No, they're not. They're not going to be feel compelled or persuaded to do anything until they're told to do so. And and then sometimes that's not even enough to persuade them. It hasn't persuaded Michigan to do anything. So, so to to imagine that a court in another state would feel compelled to do something that the state of the litigation hasn't compelled has felt compelled to do, it would be very optimistic thinking. I, I I would not expect that any state would feel compelled or persuaded or inspired to make any changes until a challenge is brought forth in those states. So my question is, what are the people waiting for in those states? And of course, I know rhetorical. That's a rhetorical question. The answer is they're waiting for funding. And they're waiting for a, a good qualified legal team, and they're waiting for the right plaintiffs to come forward that that, that hopefully will have somewhat of a, a sympathetic appeal to the court. And I know a lot of things are involved, but the registrants themselves need to be uh, organizing and supporting any organization that's credible that wants to make such a challenge, because these things are expensive, as I said. The state of Michigan ended up paying, agreeing to pay the plaintiff's attorneys, which would be the uh, ACLU of, of Michigan and the law school, I forget which law school it was that, that assisted. They ended up agreeing to pay them $1.8 million. Wow. Very, very few lawyers can afford that to, to, to carry litigation for years and years and years. I mean, in this great capital system we have, Staffers are waiting for their paychecks every week or two weeks, and when you go what? home and tell your when you go home and tell your family, I was going to pay your tuition, but <laughs> I'm carrying this registry case, and it's far more important than your future. That most spouses and, and families just don't respond very favorably to that. And, and many, you have a kid. How would your kid respond? Although he's only twelve years old. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wouldn't, if, if I don't buy him his video game, he gets a little disturbed. Um, I I just, I wanted to, you know, if we use a pretty recent high profile thing of same sex marriage, and I don't want to talk about whether you're pro or against, I don't care, but that was pushed down by, by the Supreme court. And it's not really complicated to see that it's just marriage, just spreading your vows. And now you're married and what you're describing that the registry is this component, this component, this component, this component, and they're all worded differently. That's what you're referring to as the language being different in each state, right? That is correct. That is a great analogy. And then in the in same, same-sex same marriage, you had overwhelming public support. Now, I'm not saying you had unanimous public support, but the polling at the time that decision came down was nationally very favorable. And even in a, in a significant number of states, I don't think they ever reached a majority of having a, a, a public approval of the states, but you had you had politicians who had political cover of their constituents to bring pressure to, 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 to uh, uh, adjust to the reality of same-sex marriage. I am not aware of that pressure in any state. I am not right. aware of even the most progressive state of there being a massive uprising against the registry and, and broad public support to tear it down. The, the, that type of talk usually comes from the offender themselves and the families of the offenders, but it's not a widespread public perception that the registry is bad. There was a widespread public perception that restrictions on on, on who could marry whom was a problem that it violated the equal protection clause. The other component here that I, I don't know, I don't know of an analogy in Europe that fits, but in, in my mind, and I think you've, you've said that I'm at least roughly right. The 50 States that we have are similar to the way that Europe has the European union. And it's really easy for us to think that Spain and Italy are wildly different places uh, you know, there's language differences. There's obviously cultural differences. And the United States is at least similar that Georgia and Florida are two different entities. They are 
you know, they have their own laws. And yes, then they fall under this federal umbrella. So what I was going to say about like, there's not a similarity where I don't think the European Union has anything that would represent the uh, the circuit courts that we have, where you have, you know, Italy, uh, 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 Spain, and and some other uh, country over there. They fall under some under some like oversight kind of thing, like one of our circuit courts. But what I'm what I'm trying to describe though is that each of our states, since they have their own laws, you would have to go file those challenges in each individual state. That is correct. And you might, if you were asserting a federal constitutional claim, you could bring the claim in a federal court. But but each state is an independent sovereign in the United States, and we presume that their laws are valid. We the, 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 federal, the federal system is not intended to scrutinize every state law and say this doesn't this does or this does not meet with our approval. The, the 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 federal system used the, our, as as we have uses the power of the purse, not the power of the hammer. The purse is what gets <laughs> states to come into line, because although they hate the federal government with a passion, they love those federal dollars, and you right. can persuade the states to do what you would like them to do because they can't let go of that almighty dollar. But each state is free to make its laws until they trample the U.S. Constitution. And therefore, the registry has to be challenged. And some states have a stronger protection in, in their state constitution than Maryland is an example. I cite frequently as uh, the, yep. that uh, their constitution provides a greater level of protection. And therefore, the Maryland court could really give a damn less what the federal court thinks because it violates our constitution. You can claim it violates it doesn't violate the U.S. Constitution. That's your problem. We're holding that this statute violates our constitution, and ours is the one that matters because our constitution is supreme as long as it meets the federal standards, the minimum federal standards. Can you and, remind and that, me the language in Maryland, please? I always forget. It's, it's disadvantages. So a, a law can't not be an, enacted that opposes any 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 disadvantage uh, okay. retroactively. And a disadvantage is not the same as punishment. A disadvantage could be any number of things that could disadvantage you. So, so the uh, the Maryland uh, ex post facto uh, protection is much greater. But other states have ha- had their constitutions interpreted to provide greater protection. And in fact, I think, well, not only I think, I know our state has. And I think in the case of California, and I, I'd like for someone to correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the voters in California, through one of their famous referendum processes, I believe that they passed a citizen's referendum to prohibit the Supreme Court of California from, from from interpreting the California Constitution to provide greater protection than the U.S. Constitution because the California Supreme Court got to be under a bunch of liberal do-gooders. At back at one, at, 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 I think the chief justice was named Rose Bird, if I remember right, and they were handing it out all kind of crazy stuff as far as the uh, citizens were concerned. So they, they, they did a constitutional amendment to say our, our, our Constitution is exactly the same and cannot be interpreted to provide any greater protection. If I recollect that incorrectly, a person can, can say I've got it all wrong because I, that's what I, I challenge. I dare you. I dare somebody out there to say Larry was wrong. I dare you. Well, I, I am wrong from time to time, but I, that's I my have, recollection from. from, from. I, don't, I don't. I don't have you on here as a co-host to, to to come up with you being wrong. So I challenge someone to prove that you're wrong, and I bet you you're going to find out that that Larry was probably right. So, but but yes, yeah, so so the the challenges need to flow in in those other states. Now Ohio has had multiple challenges already, and and their regist- their Supreme Court has ruled. That, that the 2007, they were the first state to, to enhance their registry. They were told that they could not apply those requirements retroactively. So, so that litigation has already been won in Ohio. We're, <sighs> we're, we're, we're waiting on Tennessee and Kentucky now. Right. And, and we need people in those states who feel that they are being hampered. In, so hang on, let me ask it this way. If the Sixth Circuit said that these things were proved to be unconstitutional. So crossing the street wearing a yellow jacket is proved to be unconstitutional. Someone in Tennessee would have to say, hey, I can't do this. I'm going to bring a challenge because I'm not allowed to walk across the street with a yellow jacket on. And you'd have to file that claim. That's a little, then, bit, of, little bit of an oversimplification. But, I, but and I, 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 I apologize. Going. I'm just, I mean, so like, you know, the, the, the Alabama thing, they said that giving up all of your internet identifiers stifles free speech if you are in a state that has 
something very similar to it, you can say, well, Alabama said it, so we could use it here. Um, and, that, and that's that's what I'm trying to describe. So if in Michigan, I don't even know what the claims are that they were asserting in, in Michigan, but let's say they, they said you can't make a thousand foot living restriction. Okay, well, I'm in Kentucky and I have a thousand foot living restriction. They said that the Sixth Circuit said that they can't do that. So I'm going to file that challenge because they said that gives them that that weight to to have the uh, the precedent. That is correct. And it, it, if, if, the, if the prohibitions are very similar, you would likely in federal court get a very similar outcome because the district court judges within that circuit are bound by that decision unless there are, are sufficient distinguishing factors that, that make that non-binding authority. When you're litigating, you're always trying to distinguish your case. If you're defending a case and, and the plaintiff is saying this this is controlling precedent, the defense attorney is saying, well, no, it isn't. Here's the distinguishing factors. And then you're, you do the same thing if you're on the other side of the issue. You're, you know, if the state is saying this is this is great stuff, the the, the when Smith versus Doe, they always cite to that as as a good plaintiff's attorney. If you're challenging the registry and think in terms of plaintiffs now rather than being defendant, we're talking about in a challenge to the registry. If you're doing it the correct way through a civil process. The plaintiff's attorney is trying to say, well, uh, we distinguish ourselves, Smith. The registry uh, that, that the Supreme Court analyzed is no longer relevant because that was first generation registration. You know, we've had multiple generations added. Uh, so, so distinguishing is what, is what the attorneys try to do to say that that's not controlling authority. But if all things are roughly equal within that circuit, you should get roughly the same outcome on, on a challenge. And one final question before we move on. What is the difference of being within the circuit and outside of it as far as how much weight that that carries? Well, it's binding in the circuit. Okay. It's it's persuasive authority outside. So Can you uh, can you expand on what persuasive would then mean getting into court and using a, an outside circuit's information on your case? You would you would take the legal analysis to uh, incorporate it into your pleading, and you would say, "This is a very thoughtful analysis done by this court. Our cases uh, are asserting virtually identical challenges. Therefore, this is persuasive. You should consider it. Although you're not bound by it, you should consider this as being." A direction you would want to take the the circuit the, the people outside that circuit of the six they can thumb their nose at it and say that's really nice but we don't see it that way uh, legal minds can agree to disagree or they can take it as persuasive authority and incorporate it into their ruling uh, but but it is very persuasive if it's a well-reasoned decision it, this the 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 sixth circuit had a well-reasoned decision i mean the, so it, it is persuasive every time it's used right 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 I have a feeling that we're not done here. <laughs> no, I'm sure we're not because what, what the what the listeners want to hear, and I'm and I'm fortunately not able to tell them that when a court rules, things are going to magically happen and dominoes yeah. are going to fall, and that's right. not what I can tell them because that's not likely to happen. Why did they have to file another lawsuit in Michigan? Yeah, to try a class to get action the- with forty thousand people. Because the 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 uh, uh, lawmakers and the the, the the authorities there say, well, it, w- this is what as an as applied challenge. If the Sixth Circuit had said registration is facially unconstitutional, which they're never going to be able to say, but if they did say that, then that would end the inquiry. That they would they they but they didn't say that. The mere act of registering someone is not facially unconstitutional. For a law law to be facially unconstitutional, it means there's virtually no set of circumstances by which you could impose such a law. You can't leave your home between 9 and noon on Sunday morning. That would be facially unconstitutional. Why? Because you have a right in the United States to worship. Right. So therefore, to prohibit, to try to prohibit, prohibit people from leaving their homes between nine and noon on Sunday morning would be invalid on its face. There'd be no set of circumstances short of martial law that that would be permissible in the United States. So therefore that that would fall. But these were as applied challenges, meaning that these particular individuals suffered the harm and the law was declared unconstitutional as applied to them. Michigan said, well, that's nice, but there's 40,000 others that we're going to continue to apply it to. Right. It only applied to those six or however many people were in the original suit. And so then they went back and brought in, hey, these 40,000 people also have similar claims. 
So you need to have this apply to them too. And they're going to get to spend a whole bunch more money if Michigan no fights shit. it. Now, now, I'm optimistic based on that AG's brief that maybe they're ready to start considering throwing in the towel and stop fighting because of the new AG. But time will tell if they actually throw in the towel. And that doesn't um, it, mean the registry goes away. That means the lawmakers are going to go, okay, well, they found this. So we'll we'll make the law less evil and you won't have to do these three things, whatever they said in Michigan that you can't do. And they'll just roll it back to either that or what it was prior to these enhancements. That's would be That would be the argument that would be made from the people who want to preserve as much as they can. They would make the argument. Of course, now we wouldn't make that argument. We would say yeah. that – that it's still violative and we would want to design. The only problem is if we're not there helping design a new registry, right. the state law right. enforcement apparatus is going to design the most onerous thing. And they might even go beyond what's permissible under the six, those versus Snyder Sixth Circuit decision. And you may have to litigate again because that law yeah. will be presumed constitutional when it's enacted and it will, it will survive until the clearest of proof shows it's not. And I'm still tickled that that a mutual friend has the opinion that we don't need to be at the state capitol to influence those things, that we just need to do it on the legal side. And I'm still very much puzzled by that opinion. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of how much you can do at the capitol. People, people have this notion that since it's not something in the everyday, ordinary person's life, that, there's, that it's all for the elite. And, and they don't realize that in, in many states you can have an enormous impact. It gets more complicated in the states that have full-time legislatures. I think Michigan is one of them. So it would be to go to Lansing, you'd probably have a little bit more trouble than going to uh, to uh, a, a capital like in, in Wyoming or Nebraska. Uh, okay. If you were in Lincoln or Wyoming, I mean, the place wide open, they invite you in and they'll talk to you as if you're a neighbor because so few people show up. I'm sure. That's because only 12 people live in those states. There's There's 17 in Wyoming. <laughs> All right. We got a uh, voicemail question from Shante, and uh, she's uh, one of our uh, longtime listeners from Alaska. Let's listen. Hello, this is Shante. I have a question. When you have a loved one, or myself, a son, who's incarcerated, and you want to set up things for his future, like a trust or a will or putting him on your life insurance as a beneficiary, how do you go about that? Because I've been reading that some states take those benefits away from your loved one. So what can you do, a parent can do, to ensure that their loved one have something when they get out of jail or prison? Thank you. Please let me know. And I'm in Alaska or Virginia, so I need those laws. Thank you for that question. And also, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it before, she's also a Patreon supporter. And thank you for that support. It's really, really, really appreciated. I remember this caller. She talked about her son, about when he gets uh-huh. out of prison, moving to... Yeah, she's trying to do a transfer. Uh, and interstate. I always forget which direction. It's one either to Alaska or from Alaska to Virginia. From Alaska. I think he's in prison in Alaska. And they're going to transfer. I remember the, the question. Yep. Well, this is a great question, but I'll start by saying that I don't know of any confiscation of resources that's related to just simply having to register. Uh, that that I'm not aware of that, and I've, I've I've looked at most every registration scheme in the country, and I guess you could look at the fees that they charge, which are, uh, I mean, they're not gargantuan, but they're they they can be a a, a few hundred dollars a year, I think, in Louisiana. Right. But the the fees that they charge would be the closest thing to it. But then when you dig a little deep, big deeper, what she may be getting at is what happens to money that the system confiscates for other reasons. People come out of incarceration having had a huge amount of financial obligations imposed upon them. The, the, the We're good in America about extracting court costs. If you look at a judgment, you'll see line after line of all these different junk fees. And then they could equal well over a thousand, couple thousand dollars before you even start talking about restitution. And fines, just the court fees for all the different things for the for the victim compensation to the brain injury fund, the court autom- automation fee, blah blah blah. You go on and on with all these fees, and and then and then you have all. So you you could have a person who owes a bunch of money, and then there's the in the federal system, and I don't know how many states have have matched this, where uh, viewing child porn is presumed to be damaging to the victim. 
So you may end up owing, if, if that's been your offense, you may end up owing for, for, for possession of images. Or if you've had a child victim, you may end up owing counseling because the child magical will need counseling for 10, 15 years after after they've been a victim of a crime. And, that, and so you may end up having a huge amount of money. And that's the money that's at risk for being taken because the judgment will say to pay these costs, pay these fines, pay these restitution as a condition of supervision. And they will do everything they can to extract those from the person, including trying to identify assets they may be holding and attach them. So what I would say that she needs to do would be, rather than trying to ask this on a podcast, which we're great uh, grateful for the question, but uh, I would say that a financial planner would be much better suited to, 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 to look into this. And I'd be willing to talk to a financial planner if, 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 if one were to surface and, and talk about all the things that people that have this conviction have to deal with in terms of where their money is at risk. But I think you're going to want to protect it from from the system in terms of the criminal justice system, not so much the registry system, but anything that may have been owed or assessed as a result of the conviction as a part of the punishment. Roll back the clock. uh, I think it was 2015, a a podcast called Freakonomics. They did uh, the title of the episode is why we continue to make sex offenders pay and pay and pay and pay and pay something like that. And through a few law professors from like Princeton and so forth, they said that people on the registry between treatment, fines, fees, lost wages, all these things, it costs about $10,000 to walk out of prison. And I'm then I'm wondering then if if you walk out and you are, I don't want to say indigent in reality, like living under a bridge, but indigent as in you can't find work, but you do have family supporting you. But if that money isn't visible to the system under your name, but mom and dad are kicking money in, they're like you're going to be treated differently with probation fees and so forth because you don't quote unquote have the money, as opposed to if you have you know some sort of I don't know you know an endowment whatever some sort of inheritance fund life insurance whatever sitting there, you know if you get two fifty or hundred fifty thousand dollars sitting in your bank account they're going to treat you very different. Well, they're going to they're going to try to take it. But what what are what right. else do you mean by that? They're going to treat you very different. I mean, people that have money get treated a little bit different because they have the potential, the power to 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 respond differently than a person who's indigent. I I mean, if you don't have money when it comes around to pay your probation fee, and you literally have four dollars in your bank account, they're not going to take your four dollars out of your bank account. But if you have a hundred grand in the bank, they're going to make you pay your twenty eight dollars or whatever your monthly probation fee is. Well, a lot of states, not, they don't take the $4, but they lock you up for failure to comply with terms of probation. And you, ha- you have since uh, sort of a debtor's prison. We've talked about that in right. Louisiana uh, with uh, right. with King Alexander. They, 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 It's unconstitutional as hell, but they do it. I know that, that even here, at least the treatment provider that I went to, if you were that down on your luck, he was not going to kick you out of class for not being able to pay for treatment. And I know that that's not always true in not all cases. I'm specifically stating that particular individual, but somebody going in there saying they don't have the money. He's like, yeah, you know, make it up later and pay over time, whatever. I'm just, that's what I mean by people get treated different. If you're broke, they, they, they cut you some slack. Maybe. I wish, depending I, on wish the state. That, <laughs> I wish that were, I wish that were a universal phenomena, but yeah, unfortunately I'm with it's you. not. Uh, uh, you have had the, uh, the, the good fortune of encountering things that very few people encounter. And uh, I agree. Uh, we, 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 we should not, uh, we should not presume that that's the benefit because people get violated for not paying and they get incarcerated for not paying, although it's unconstitutional. We're supposed to have eradicated debtors prisons a long time ago, but right. we, we, we still do that. Well, Shante, thank you very much for the question. And also thank you for continuing to be a Patreon supporter. Um, and in doing that, I happened to just log over to Patreon and I forgot to uh, mention that we have a couple, uh, new supporters and we got Robert and Mac both coming in at the hustler level. And thank you guys so very, very, very much. It's really awesome that you support us and Michael from Florida, you increased your support and you are just a hoss. And again, I can't thank you guys enough for your support. It's just really humbling and just again, makes me all squishy inside. Well, the hustler level now, has anyone taken my suggestion to, look at their net pay and to sign up for the amount of their net pay. Has anyone done that yet? Surprisingly, no. And I'm really shocked at that. I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, I know that I would, if I were, if you I would, you would run right there and, and fill in all the zeros. Would you? 
No, I was, I'm actually kidding, but I was so flattered. I know. Because, because I would, you know, in my age and generation, the, the thought of supporting a podcast, well, I didn't know what one was until we started this program. And the, just the thought of actually valuing something enough to send in a monthly contribution, it was just a foreign thing to me. So uh, I've, I've learned a lot from people, how they value this, uh, and, and, and not just this, but so many podcasts that they value that they support. And, you know, people have tens, tens of thousands of donors uh, that, that have, have large audiences. And I never would have known. Absolutely. It's really, it's really, I mean, I support a bunch of different uh, content creators, honestly. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, well, let's move on to some articles. Uh, one of my favorite media outlets is Vox and that's a V O X, not the one with an F, but, uh, Vox, they, uh, they cover things to me, it feels like they just cover it from policy and like, this would be a good idea. This would be a bad idea. Forget the partisan side of it. And this article is entitled the case for capping all prison sentences at 20 years. Um, neat, neat article. Even the author says it's a pipe dream that we would ever get there. But if someone commits a bunch of crimes when they're 20 years old, they're probably not going to commit the same crime when they're 40 plus all of the if, if garbage in garbage out, you know, I'm a computer person, but if you put someone in a, an environment with a bunch of hardened criminals at 20, they're probably going to be impressionable and, and learn the, the ways of being a criminal and you've possibly just ruined them for when they get out. It's a neat article cover. I, I think it pr- presents some pretty good ideas and rationale behind the idea that we should, uh, should cap sentences at 20 years. But one thing specifically that I liked out of the article, it says, what are prisons for? Are they for keeping the public safe, rehabilitating inmates purely for revenge? If our answer as a society is the first two, but not the latter, then a cap is something we should consider. But I think that we uh, primarily put people in prison for revenge, not for any sort of rehabilitation or public safety. Well, it, uh, I agree. It's a great long article. I, I read the entire thing. I think I'm the one that found it, but uh, it's 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 a fantastic article if you can stay focused long enough to read it. And and uh, it, but yeah, I think it's a pipe dream, certainly in my lifetime, to to think we're going to get there, because in our forgiving country that we live in, we're not <laughs> we're not actually that forgiving. And you hear just we'll hear just you'll hear justifications when people say they should get a long sentence, an extraordinary long sentence, as they don't deserve to walk and breathe free air again. Well, that's a value judgment you're making based on something they did when they were 19, 20, 23, 27. You don't know what that person could become over the next couple of decades in the right environment, but you pronounce them not fit to ever breathe and be among us again. That's an emotional response. It's not backed up by evidence. The evidence shows just the contrary, but but we're not particularly evidence evidence driven here when we when we formulate public policy. We we do a lot of it based on emotion, and the emotion is he did something awful. He never deserves to be free again. You told me sometime very early in our in our friendship that I, I think you said after about two years. Like the punishment side of it is gone, I mean, and like the uh, the the value of the prison. Like beyond that, you're just you're just uh, being vengeful. I said something to that effect, and 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 what I uh, it gives me a good chance to clear that up. I don't mean a broken person can be fixed within two years, depending on what type of re- rehab they need. But what I mean, if you're just wanting to feel good about punishment, you you've prison is a sh- shocking and awful enough place that taking someone's freedom away for two or three years, that's about as good as you're going to accomplish with that, with, with, with just the deprivation of freedom. If you want to move beyond just simply deprivation of, pre, of freedom, then you have to incorporate some expensive services in prisons that we're generally not willing to pay for in America, which is the beginning of reentry with a focus on preparing for reentry. And that's, that's a long way off. Uh, some states are beginning to talk about reentry, but it's just not something we focus on. If we're going to have you reenter, we need to prepare you for reentry. Otherwise, we're setting up another disaster. Right. And, and, and and so, yes, yeah, so, in a couple, three years, all the, all the deterrent value, had, by then they've acclimated to prison life. And if you keep yeah. them for three more, six more, ten more, it doesn't make any difference. Actually, it makes it worse because the debt, the, 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 the barriers – to, the, there's no additional deterrent value to keeping them for 10 years, but the, the barriers 
grow exponentially as whatever skills they had a connection and, and understanding of the modern society evaporate. Uh, I don't know how long that you were behind the walls, but how much did life change while you're behind the walls? It, for it, me it, personally, it didn't. For me personally, it didn't. But I, uh, someone that seventeen, excuse me, that does like seventeen years, and that wasn't technology focused going in, the world is radically different after seventeen, twenty, thirty years. It is amazingly different. So at that point, we might as well. We could do one or two things. We could keep you in prison at thirty, then the low thirties to as high as some states spend in the high forties. Right. per inmate, or we could cut you a check and let you <laughs> out because we're not going to let you make a living. Your felony record and all the barriers yeah. we placed and the fact that you're tattooed from head to toe and got bolts and screws and all this stuff hanging out of you, nobody's going to hire you anyway. And of course, you, you can make a choice not to do the tattoos. That's not being forced upon you. But But if we don't prepare you for working in the modern society and help you with housing and help you make that transition – we're setting up a system of, uh, of of failure. We'd be better off if I were a state budgeter, and even though I, if I, I if I'm uh, if I were to be a very conservative person, I'd rather cut you a check for twenty four thousand than to spend forty two thousand keeping. When you do math the way they taught me, twenty four thousand is less than forty two thousand. But Fake that's news. not gonna, that's not going to be a very popular sell to keep to, no to totally go, not to, to go ahead and cut people a check and let them out. They're, that's just not going to go over in our country very well. What do you no, mean cut them a check? <laughs> I know, but it, it brings up like that, that plays right into the hand of the UBI. It plays right into the hand of that. <laughs> uh. <sighs> All right. Uh, UBI being universal basic income or some sort of flat fee for everyone to just live, whatever. But yeah, pl- to me, if, if to me, it feels like it plays right into that. If you would, if you're, if you're willing to spend 50 to keep them locked up, it sounds like you'd be willing to pay. Cause probably in, in the majority of cases, correct me if I'm wrong, Crimes are financially driven most of the time. Significant amount of the time, economic driven. And people say that you don't have to do it, that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, society is true. There is true. There is truth some in tru- it. There's not- some truth in that. Because but- you, I, you know, not, not to get personal, you are an example of that. Correct? Well, but, I, but I had a lot of lucky breaks. I didn't win the ovarian Fair. lottery. But I've had a lot of <laughs> – what the hell is so funny? The ovarian lottery. That's funny. I like that one. That's one of the cleanest ones you've ever shared with me. <laughs> but but I, I've had a lot of lucky breaks. Being at the sure. right place at the right time makes a yes. lot of difference. And, 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 and if you if you uh, listen to the song, a little a child was born in the ghetto. Uh, what was that, Elvis from the late 1960s? Uh, uh, okay. In the ghetto is the name of the song. If you actually are born in the ghetto and you actually have to dodge the things that people that grow up in the ghetto have to do to stay alive, you're not as likely to acclimate to taking advantage of opportunities. And the opportunities are a lot more uh, sparse because yeah. there's not a lot of places to get work in the ghetto. Businesses don't tend to locate in the ghetto and you're trapped in the ghetto. And, yep. and, and so pulling yourself up by your boots. Now, I was in the ghetto, so to speak, except I didn't know that I was at the time because poverty was much more rampant in the 1960s than it is today. They were, we were in the midst of the war on poverty. And a lot of people around me didn't have much more. We lived in mobile homes. And your friend uh, up the road lived in a mobile home. And the, friend, the next one did as well. And, and you all were roughly the same. And, and as far as you knew, your little world when you're when you're growing up, if you if you're living in that setting, and everybody else says you don't think as much about it, but when you live in an inner city, where there's the, there's these immaculately cared for lawns and these nice luxurious cars and people wearing fine jewelry and clothing, and they're going to these big beautiful schools that have gates, and you're going to this school that's run down, and and and, and there's there's uh, drugs being dealt, and there's people there's people uh, committing crimes all around you, and you don't know if you're going to make it through the night without a bullet coming through. That changes your outlook on life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to tell you, but it does. Sure. How how much you can focus on being a good student is dramatically altered by those those circumstances that you find yourself in in the ghetto, which you didn't choose. That was the ovarian lottery that chose that for you. I love that. 
Hey, you want to talk about public defenders again? Oh, I love I love bashing the Wisconsin public defender system in other states <laughs> as well. This comes out of Wisconsin Public Radio, and it's totally there's there's no meat to the article. It is a it is about a twenty minute listen, and uh, it's 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 a it's a decent listen. I recommend you go listen to it. But apparently, public defenders they're they are the lowest paid in the country at about forty bucks an hour. Here's my question to you, Larry, that I didn't hear anybody ask or answer on the show. So. 40 bucks an hour is pretty good pay. That's $80,000 a year. But I'm curious, is this salary money or is this like contractor money, 1099 kind of money? That changes the economics a lot. It's 1099 money. Aha. Okay. So where you think it's 40 bucks an hour, you probably can only keep somewhere between a third and a half once you account for paying for your taxes, once you account for paying for education, you know, all of those things that a company pays for for you. So now you're only talking that these guys are making about guys, gals are making about 14 bucks an hour for they spent a gazillion years in law school. 14 bucks an hour is kind of shit. Well, on, on a contract basis, it is now. Now, starting attorneys, uh, 40 bucks an hour, I got to do the arithmetic. I used to be good in my head. Uh, 40 bucks an hour uh, t- times 40 is uh, yeah. 1,600 times 52. That's 83,000. That, that's a decent salary for an attorney because with benefits you have, if you're an employed in the public defender system. Yes, absolutely, that, absolutely. That, absolutely. It, where they're paying for your health care and they're paying for your vacations. Uh-huh. And the, but when you're getting 40 bucks an hour when you're billing, first of all, you're not getting 40 hours a week in most cases of billable hours. You're getting a cap, like in our state, the contract public defenders. Now we have a we have a hybrid system. We have we have a public defender system where they're paid employees of the state, and we have a public defender system that contracts. The scales are so low, you may get six or seven hundred dollars for a felony case, or and right. it, 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 it'll translate out to sometimes less than forty bucks an hour, depending on how many hours you put into it. But so it, yeah, they get paid. That, that's that's pretty miserable. But I mean, you know, I bill out. At, at X rate, and I, I purposely, I have to put away a third for taxes. I have to put away a third for my own benefits package, so to speak, whether that be vacation or uh, health and so forth. And then I get to roughly keep about a third. That's the way that I sl- uh, that's the way I plot it out. So I, I didn't hear them a- ask that question. I thought that uh, I wasn't sure if that was going to be ten ninety nine money. If it is, then they're not making any money at all. They're really in miserable shape. Oh, well, it, it says something about the commitment that we have to public def- indigent defense in this in this country, and I know we'll get hate mail every time I say that. You know, you should love it <laughs> or leave it, but it it is it is it's an essential thing that we have to provide, or else we need to amend the Constitution and say you're not entitled to counsel. It's you seek or swim, and if you don't have the money, too bad. You shouldn't have done the crime. I mean, maybe that's what people want, but. But that's not what we. That is totally what it is. But you know, we we talk about that all the time. Innocent until proven guilty. So shouldn't you have some level? And I'm not saying public defenders aren't competent, but they're overworked, meaning they can spend less time with their with their charge and all that stuff. Uh, Anyway, it's garbage. Go listen to the show. It's a decent uh, portrayal of them being the lowest paid public defenders in the country. Good times. And then, hey, you know, I'm not really a fan of this guy. This guy is pushing. Uh, this law, this Marcy's law around the country. This is from Mississippi Today dot org, and victims' rights bill pushed by California billionaire quietly up for debate in legislature. Marcy's law creates. We talked about this last week, I think, with Josh, in that it creates quote unquote rights for the victims to have a say in, like the entire like sentencing, post sentencing, post treatment of how a conviction of a person convicted of a crime is treated. And I I'm really not, I mean, they, there are many places where these things kind of already exist. This just makes it more right. Er, like you have more rights in doing this, but good grief, man. Why, why does the victim have any sort of say in how someone gets treated in their conviction? That's what the laws are for. Not for what this billionaire would like to see as a pipe dream. Well, uh, I zeroed in on a quote in here. It says, we can all agree. Well, let's make sure we attribute it to the person. I think it's Philip Gunn uh, who sponsored it, who's the uh, yeah. speaker. He says, we can okay. all agree that no rapist shall have uh, should have more rights than the victim. No murderer should be afforded more rights than the victim's family. The group's website reads, uh, Marcy's Law would ensure that victims have the same co-equal rights as the accused and convicted nothing more, nothing less. Now, what Josh said last week has finally 
sunk into my skull. It was, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was taking me some time to process it. But what he was trying to say, and thanks, Josh, for, for, for putting it eloquently. I just couldn't follow it. The person we're protecting is the one who is going to have their liberties taken away. Right. And the victim is not in danger of having their liberties taken away. Now, if they were held at a gunpoint. They had their liberty temporarily taken away. But the system is protecting the person who might be put in a cage for a very, very long time. We have to try to make sure that we only put people in cages that should be in those cages. And that's that's why they don't have equal rights, because Josh was saying they don't the government's not trying to do anything to them. They're not trying to deprive them of any right. Right. Taking a person's freedom away is a pretty sub substantial removal of rights. Therefore, we have to protect that person, even if we don't like what they were accused of doing, to make sure we get it correct. I need to spend some time and actually like frame my mind around this idea of what it means. So you see an interaction between a person and a cop and like, I know my rights. You can't do that to me. So that officer is doing something to remove liberties away from a person whether you know you've been handcuffed you're like i know my rights you can't put me in cuffs for this long what is the victim what rights are do they have that are being in any degree squashed by the person getting out of prison anything of that nature that they're trying to increase victims rights to cover well they would argue that the victim has the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and therefore this creeper uh, uh, would, would, uh, would take that away from them. So therefore, they should have the right to prevent that from happening. But see, as I've said on other podcasts, you don't get to decide what the punishment is. You're merely a witness when you're a victim of a right. crime. This is a crime that has been committed against the people. The people have yeah. organized and formed a governmental system, and they have decided what boundaries are in terms of acceptable behavior, and they've determined how to orderly administer those boundaries so that we don't have mob justice and have vengeance. And so you don't get to make the decision when the person comes out again. That's for a person or an entity that has far more objectivity than you are likely to have as being a victim. You're going to see it differently. You're not going to want to take any chance again on someone coming out because they hurt you. So you can't be objective about whether they've been rehabilitated or not. And so you'd say keep right. them keep them locked up, and we'll be safer. Well, maybe we wouldn't be any safer. Let me ask you this question in regard to like the policies of how these things go through. Why would law enforcement agencies oppose this? I would. I personally would think that they would be in favor of it. You would personally think that, but what it does is it, the, the more they stack these requirements on, the more cumbersome it becomes to, to, to meet all the burdens the, of okay. this uh, victim of bill of rights. And you end up eventually losing cases because things that – because on the defense side, what, what we're going to do is try to find loopholes of something you did wrong. We're going to try to find a timeline. If we can't find anything else, we're going to try to find a timeline to shoot your case down because we're trying to win the case. <laughs> we're not trying to get to the truth. We're trying to win the case. And, and, and so, so the law enforcement, I'm, I'm sure, is concerned about the extra cumbersome nature that it, it's going to take. And, and if cases end up getting lost because they get too darn complicated to meet all these requirements, and, and uh, you, you you need to push our our meat grinder needs to keep running because we run a lot of <laughs> we we run a lot of people through it in this country. And and uh, of course, I would think it'd be a good thing in some cases fell through the cracks, but law enforcement probably doesn't think it's be a good thing. Because sure. they're being yelled at, well, why didn't – well, because the X, Y, and Z in this but loophole, generally what law enforcement tells people, well, we can't prosecute them because of statute of limitations. Well, the oh, victims, then we certainly need to go after that one, don't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely we need to go after that. <laughs> so, we, I mean, we can't have something that uh, provides fairness. So, so I, I, I suspect without being uh, – uh, having law enforcement here in the studio, so that's probably their concern. Okay. Well, I, f I figured you have talked to them or heard their arguments along the way in your 150 years that have you been on this earth. I just turned 90 last week, so let's don't overdo it. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747 
888-447-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registry matters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. All right, let's move on to our, our super duper favorite person of the week. This guy wins like the, uh, the, the schmuck award. I don't know how to put this any other way. So this is uh, at a Detroit news. It's a ex Detroit homicide cop found with a locker of evidence. The funny thing is, is like his, he's being evicted and they're rummaging through his things. Like the movers are there like cleaning out his, his apartment. I don't know. They didn't really say, and they found a box full of evidence And what I find interesting in the article, it says, we're concerned that this could taint some cases. The word taint in this context to me sounds like it could make the cases bad. But like, so what you're really saying is you don't want to have a conviction overturned that there was evidence that could, uh, is the word exculp? Is that the right word? Yep, exculpatory. Okay, Uh, exculpatory evidence in that box that would have, have let someone go free that was actually innocent. But this asshole has evidence at his home potentially and the thing goes on it says what if some of the evidence was never introduced in court i'm not saying that's what happened right now we just don't know but that's what we're looking into shouldn't we be concerned that there are people erroneously locked up no that uh anyway so yeah uh this one (laughs) this is really sad well it it has the potential depending on what the evidence is because an attorney that's got someone serving life without parole, <laughs> if they hear yeah. evidence, uh, even though it's strapped, uh, and even the ones on death row, even more so, but if, if you're facing the needle, or and I guess they brought back yeah. the, uh, the firing squad in, in Nevada, then they are in, sweet. And, and Somewhere. Someone, yeah, because we couldn't get the three drug cocktail out of Europe because they said it was inhumane. But no, the uh, U.S., we still have to go. We still have to go juice them up with the three chemicals. Yeah. Well, and I think they uh, they fired up the electric chair in another a state that had had not used it for a long time. So we, good grief, but, dude. Sparky. <laughs> Sparky is, is, is alive and well. But uh, the attorneys that particularly who represent anyone who's facing death or life without parole, they're going to be trying to figure out if any of these cases – if this detective had a hand in any of, uh, aspect of their case, yeah. and that's exactly what they should do. Yes, not, they should be. Like, shouldn't shouldn't the DA be like, we need to bring those cases back up because we could have locked up somebody erroneously. But that's not the attitude that I'm getting. That's not what they're going to do. Uh, it, it's unlikely. There's uh, there's a, 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 a large number of DAs, and I can't put a percentage on it, but will try to cling to their conviction and say that this is all irrelevant. Uh, there might be an Alex Hunter out there that used to serve up in Boulder, but uh, they're far and few between. And uh, so, so you would uh, you, you'd more likely have them fighting to preserve the conviction because it's closure of the case. We can't reopen yeah. this case. We've got closure. The victim knows what happened to their loved one. And, and uh, I mean, we, we reopen this case. All that pain and suffering comes back and, and uh, we can't do that. Uh, so, so uh, it, they cling to those convictions for with, with with tenacity. They don't want it to reopen cases. You, just the opposite. You should want to reopen the case because if you've got the wrong person, what does that mean? The person who did it is likely still roaming free if they haven't died. Right. And uh, I was listening to something else, and I was just going to mention go go back and listen to two or three episodes ago of a podcast called Cognitive Dissonance. They did two one hour segments on some a handful of documentaries about our criminal justice system. And they said, if you have the wrong person locked up, you have three victims. Now you have the person locked up is erroneously locked up and not not you have three injustices, I should say. The person that did the crime is still running free. There's an injustice. And the victim is not made whole because the wrong person is in jail. And, uh, and certainly the person that's the wrong, uh, the wrongfully in jail, they're being victimized. Their life is being taken away from yeah. them. There's no, there's no amount of money we can give you. Nope. We can't give you nope. the growing back up with your kids that you were taken away from if yep. you had children. We can't give you the the future you might would have had if you didn't, weren't saddled with this felony conviction. We can't undo all that. I don't know what it would look like, but it feels to me that we need to have a a system, an economic incentive or some sort of incentive structure for justice, not convictions. I don't know how to implement or how to do that, but it feels to me like, hey, Larry, if you do extra good work at work, 
we're going to give you a bonus this year. Sweet. I will do extra good work. But that's not how we run it. You just like, hey, you need to flip through as many pages of the things that you need to flip through and you'll get your paycheck. Oh, so you well, just flip now, through the pages. Now, now let's just play on this a little bit. Now remember, most prosecuting district attorneys and state's attorneys are elected in this country, the overwhelming majority of them. So let's imagine for a moment that the DA stands before his constituents, his or her constituents running for re-election. Says, I will tell you one thing, I'm the most proud of, of my office. We have reviewed, in my last four-year term, we have reviewed 17,000 referrals from law enforcement, and we found about 40% of them to be totally lacking in evidence that, that even that can't even meet the most rudimentary standard of probable cause, much less proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So I chose not to indict those. I sent another 35% of them to deferral programs because these are first-time offenders, and I don't think they that society benefits from them having a criminal record. So we really only took a small portion of the cases that we took seriously uh, that we actually prosecuted to the to the hilt, and of those uh, of, of those we uh, that we took to, to took to trial. Since we took them to trial and we took a hard no stand, we didn't plea bargain. Uh, uh, Thirty percent of those were found not guilty. So I've got a great record. Can you imagine what the response of the audience would be if they if they if they campaigned on that platform? And, and I and I and I understand that that's where it would go. But so then the po- the the public also thinks that like the only way that a DA is effective is by getting convictions. But we have an ignoramus public. Thank you, Bugs Bunny that thinks that convictions are the way to judge uh, the effectiveness of the person, but the person is supposed to get justice, not convictions. And our public just wants justice. They just want, they just want vengeance convictions. Well, well yeah. When, when, when you, when you are on the receiving end of a crime and you call the DA's office, you call the state's attorney's office, you know, we're here all this mumbo jumbo about, uh, well, you know, we yeah. feel like this case is best handled by a diversionary program. And we really don't think a harsh sentence is a, a, a treatment is in order. Uh, that try, try doing that and see how long you stay in office. It'd be only the rarest of prosecutors yeah. that would, that would survive the public scrutiny because what they do is they'd run call up channel two in Atlanta. You're right. not going to believe right. I just called, right. I just called the DA's office and they told me they weren't interested in prosecuting. They were trying to, uh, to divert this person because that was the best thing for public policy. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> So I think we have to look at ourselves in the mirror just a little bit for, for, for the reason why we're the way we are. We absolutely do. So speaking of, of victims' rights, Larry, uh, we, we, we often talk about uh, re-victimizing that you, know, you, can't, you can't bring a, a, a witness into court because, oh my God, they'd be so traumatized over it again. Trying to remove the whole controversy thing that you're, you're a fan of Scalia for saying – and there is a case running around, and we pulled this from NBC Nightly News, and there is a case running around about, uh, f- forgive me, I have no idea who this guy is. I know he's on a TV show called Empire. He's a good looking black dude, and uh, he alleges that he got kind of roughed up. So here's a clip from NBC. Tonight, we're hearing from the TV star at the center of a story we've been following, Jesse Smollett, speaking out about the attack he says he suffered last month. Ron Mott has details. I'm pissed off. Appearing with Robin Roberts for Thursday's Good Morning America, Empire star Jesse Smollett striking back at those questioning his account of being attacked near his Chicago apartment last month. Is it the the attackers? It's the is attackers, it? but it's also the attacks. It's like, you know, at first it was a thing of like, listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Then it became a thing of like, oh, how can you doubt that? Like, how do you how do you not believe that? It's the truth. Smollett told police two men assaulted him, put a rope around his neck, poured liquid on him, and yelled racial and homophobic slurs. Police say they have poured through hundreds of hours of surveillance footage, but have found no evidence of an assault and no independent corroborating information supporting the actor's allegations. This week, Chicago police say Smollett turned over a heavily redacted photo of his cell phone call log. He told authorities he was on the phone with his manager when he was approached. Police want a more complete digital version of his call logs, they say, to help narrow the timeline. City officials continue to consider Smollett a possible crime victim, but say he will be held accountable if they suspect the actor filed a false report. Ron Mott, NBC News, Chicago. One thing that I would like to bring up is they said they pour they've poured through like hundreds of hours of surveillance footage 
I don't think that Joe Schmo civilian would get that kind of treatment if they just say they were roughed up. They might look through, I don't know, five minutes of video. But because of this guy's high profile nature, they're they're going ab- above and beyond what they normally would to try and validate his claim. Well, that's the point that I wanted to illustrate is that it's not re-victimizing a person to say that in the United States of America, although I believe everything you just told me, I have to go in and convince 12 citizens beyond a reasonable doubt that this occurred and that the person we, we, we bring in did it. And th- 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 that is not a victimization because as a defense attorney, you're going to get cross-examined as you should about any inconsistent statement you gave the police. If you told the police, like, for example, Mr. Smollett said that the guy was five five and that he had a, a slim build and he had a scar on his left cheek and the person that's in police custody doesn't have that, well, I'm going to be all over that at cross-examination. Now, why did you tell the police that the person was five five and they had a scar and they had a slight build? Well, this guy has obviously got a 40-inch waistline and I don't see any scar. Well, why the discrepancy? That is legitimate because we're trying to put the person in a cage for a long period of time. And we have to know that the right person is being put into the cage. It's not any degradation to the person who's the witness on the stand. It's to make sure we've got it right. Do you think that they're willing to – do you think they're willing to push back on this particular case because it's a dude and not a – excuse me, a chick, a female? I think it's because it's not a sex offense. The police are actually doing exactly what they should do, which is to take every accusation that comes in and tell the person, we, we're in an evidence-gathering phase right now. And the more evidence we can gather, the more succinctly you can describe things, the quicker we can get this down, the better off we're going to be because I'm going to be way nicer to you than the, than the opposing counsel is going to be because their job is to is to make sure I don't win. And I'm on your side, but but we've got to get this right, I, and, and and that's the way it has to be in this country. And 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 the victims' advocates keep saying that to put people through any scrutiny is a revictimization. I don't believe it is a revictimization. I believe it can be uncomfortable. Absolutely, it can be uncomfortable. But it's it's not it's not the purpose to to revictimize you. We're trying to put someone away in a very difficult situation that they're going to endure for a long period of time with life altering consequences. We need to get this right. Absolutely. You know what my favorite thing is in Iowa, the state with like twelve people. What's your favorite thing? I love hearing from a police officer saying that because of the wacky weather, that they are burdened by compliance checks of registrants. Here's a here's a clip clip from Iowa Five. Local five in eastern Iowa, the Scott County Sheriff is looking to make some big changes to the way the department handles sex offender cases. Under a proposal, it would mean a government employee would handle the work full time. Local five's Jacob Pecklow looked at what it could mean here in central Iowa. Story County is one of several sheriff's departments that we reached out to to see if the prospect of this proposal would really work out for them. They tell us it would certainly be beneficial, but there would also need to be a lot of control in how it was carried out. My first thought is that it would help um, in regard to easing that burden a little bit. In Story County, Sergeant Elizabeth Quinn coordinates 15 sheriff's deputies to run quarterly checks on more than 100 sex offenders. And that group is made up of a first shift, second shift, and third shift deputy. That way they always have um, someone that is available to be doing the checks. With the wild winter weather, getting those checks done can be challenging. It isn't easy because um, we do have the responsibility to make sure that we're upholding the law and all the laws. Other departments like Polk and Madison counties divide the workload among two or three deputies. And even with a potential ease in workload, Quinn says an outside hire is no sure thing. Depending on how this bill is written, um, what the requirements would be of the person that's chosen to do those compliance checks um, instead of ourselves. Quinn says the database they're constantly updating includes a lot of confidential information, and they don't want it falling through the cracks. Working also with the Department of Public Safety to maintain that registry, it would have to be an individual that would also have those privileges. So until the idea grows a bit more formal, Quinn trusts her team to get the job done. It can be overwhelming. We may not always have the time, but we make time 
to make sure that we're doing our compliance checks. In Nevada, Jacob Peklo, Local 5 News, We Are Iowa. To, to cover that in reverse, that last part they said where they have to update this database, blah, blah, blah. We've, we've talked about, couldn't, there, couldn't you go to a website and there could be a massive disclaimer like, you are certifying that you live at this address, you work at this address, and like under penalty of death, you're checking this, that this information is valid. Hey, that database doesn't like the person did the database update. Poof, that problem solved. Well, but when we can't take a person who's been convicted of a sexual offense at their word, they would put down bogus addresses. And if we don't check, they're out there roaming the countryside committing new sex offenses. We can't have that. Right. But like I like under penalty, you know, perjury, whatever you're certifying that you're. So I, I'm just saying like that part of the equation would be taken out. I just love that they're bitching about like, oh, my God, here's this extra burden on us. The bur- like, hey, that burden could go away by checking less frequently or not at all. Yeah, well, but see, they can't do that because the sheriffs are largely elected officials. And they get good PR from doing those checks, even though it eats into their budget and it it, 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 it strips away law enforcement resources that would probably be better deployed in other ways. But it's pu- what the public wants until the public starts telling them to quit doing this, which I don't see that happening. They're going to check on. See, my scheme is since I know the public's not going to quit doing that. My scheme yeah. is to get it out of law enforcement. I right. don't think that I don't think a civil regulatory scheme ought to be administered by law enforcement. So therefore, I want to take it out of law enforcement hands altogether because it's civil regulatory, non-punitive. So therefore, it should be handled by an agency that does civil regulatory oversight. That'd be more like a motor vehicle division with no in, with no uh, interaction with law enforcement because it's after all, it's just a civil tracking mechanism. <laughs> and I know that you have sinister plans there for real. Well, absolutely. If, 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 if it's civil regulatory, let's make it what it is. Let's take it out of law enforcement and turn it over to a regulatory entity. And I, I and, mean, I, you, you, your, your sinister method is, I, I, I don't, I don't want to divulge anything that you might be trying to keep secret. Well, there's nothing to divulge. This is a civil regulatory scheme. So they say, therefore it should not be handled by law enforcement. Now, you, you, you're trying to have it both ways. If it's civil regulatory, let's put it in a civil regulatory agency. If you want it to be punitive, then just say that and we'll leave it with law enforcement. But you can't have it both ways. Well, I, I'll, I'll cut it if you want me to. But isn't there a budgetary uh, element in there? If it goes to mean? the civil side, I, you have said if it goes to the civil uh, like, you know, DMV kind of place, then there will be a budget request and someone will have to go do a survey on how much this actually costs well, for them we, to we, actually fund already, it. We, but we've for, already- We've already done that. We already we we've already proposed to move it to the state police. So we've already got we've already got an estimate of what it cost. Oh, okay. So, well, I I didn't so, want I didn't want to like b- yeah, reveal yeah. that if that was one of your no, sinister no, no, that's, strategies. That's, that's, that that would be a strategy that other states should employ. Is yeah. Get get sponsorship to move it from this hybrid model, which conceals it within county budgets, and county budgets are not uh, subject to 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 the state control, they may get some state dollars, but the county budgets are decided by county commissioners and county selectmen and county, whatever they call it, uh, commissioners, uh, uh, councilmen, all these different things that county governmental entities they elect people, and they 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 decide how much to allocate to the sheriff's department, and and uh, and, and as with, as they run for office, they're not going to run out on the campaign trail and say, I'll tell you one damn thing, I could sure provide a whole lot better service to you if I didn't have to keep track of all these sex offenders. Yeah, sure. That's not going to do very well uh, on the campaign trail. It just it works just the opposite. I'm keeping you safe from these sex offenders by putting resources out there to monitor them and make sure that we keep track and tabs on them. That is exactly what the public wants to hear. But since I know yeah. the public isn't going to change, I want to move it away from the sheriff altogether, from the police altogether, because it's civil and regulatory. So let's have right. no law enforcement involvement in a civil regulatory scheme. Now, law enforcement would only come into play when the person goes non-compliant. And the non-compliance can be identified by community tips. It could be by forms that are sent out that people need to bring in within so many days of them going out. If, they, if, if the form gets returned as undeliverable, no longer lives here, then law enforcement comes in to do the tracking to figure out where the person went. I really but like your this, plan. You're you're like you're you're really into some 4D chess, though. Well, it, I I want to force them to decide if it's punitive or if it's regulatory. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I, I don't know. When you go to get a driver's license, do you have to do you have to go be fingerprinted, butt printed, sit in a holding cell? <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of sheriff's offices actually have people in effective detention when you're going to yes. do this so-called civil regulatory scheme. You go behind locked doors. You can't leave once you've started the process. You're effectively detained. Now, you actually could leave. You could say you have no lawful authority to hold me, and I need you to open the door. Very few people are going to do that. You would be a ballsy person for saying that. Well, particularly if you were on your last day before, you could, before you'd before be non-compliant, and they deliberately right, manipulate right. people like that. They tell them, your day is to come in on this day. Well, if you look at the calendar one day over, then they say, well, you can leave all you want to, but we'll go get a warrant for you because you'll be in non-compliance tomorrow. Then what do you do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> On another front, a, web, a website called govtech.com. Never heard of this one. Uh, the title of this article is Police Hope Software Can Help Avoid Losing Sex Offenders. I don't know that. I mean, have we actually lost anybody goes back to what I was just saying about filling out a form on a website and certifying. I mean, do you do other things? Like I, I re-registered my car. It's like, Hey, you're certifying that all this information is accurate under penalty of perjury and you click yes. And you put in your credit card and off you go. So here, but here, this is to me, this feels very sinister. This feels very, we sh- there should be something HIPAA related to this, like uh, the, the, the healthcare, like privacy stuff. Uh, here's a private entity that is going to help law enforcement keep track of registrants so that even across state lines that you have the information of registrants available to uh, other uh, other districts. This company is called Offender Watch. This is, to me, this feels really sinister. And they're totally capitalizing on this quote unquote civil regulatory scheme and helping law enforcement agencies share information. And I don't think that that should be handed over to a consumer, uh, a, uh, a commercial entity. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, I don't, yeah. What am I going to do about it? I don't, I don't have an answer <laughs> to that for sure. I, I, I just, I just feel like the, like, like the sheriff said on the other clip that we had, you know, we have, we have private sensitive data. We have their, their name, address, telephone number, height, weight. You have all of that stuff presented here. And now you're giving it over to a, a a corporate entity to to handle it. I know all the all the team red people out there are saying, well, corporations can do it better than governments, so put it in the hands of the of companies. That's correct, Andy. Corporations, private entities, they do everything better than government. They run water systems better. They run prisons better. They do sanitation yeah. services better. I don't know why you don't understand it. We flaming <laughs> liberals, you you always want to you always want to do government have government involved in things. They need to keep their nose out of the private sector. Can run parks better. It, it doesn't make any difference. They can do everything better than government. This is crazy, so, sinister. So, I so, do not so like this one. One let's, bit. Let's let's move on. This, this is this is not even an article to talk about. All right then. Well then we'll just cover the uh, the feature thing. Yeah, the the pri- private sector. I mean, they deserve this information. They deserve to make a bunch of money off of off of off of data that's been collected at the government's expense. Uh, yes, I, I mean, after all, they did this all themselves. You remember? <laughs> yes. So, tell yes. me what you really think about Offender Watch. I don't completely understand it. It was kind of an article I was I was having trouble understanding, but I, I get for, for understanding. I get. I'm not. I'm not excited about it. I'm not excited when companies come in and strip out government data and make a fortune off of it. They do that across the board. They do it with your yeah. with your property ownership records. They do that with with marriage records. I mean, they come in and and, and they don't pay for it or pay very pittances on the dollar of, of what it actually costs to assemble that. And they assert some right to it, and then they get it, and then they resell it for a massive amount of money. And they call themselves entrepreneurs, and they are in a sense. They figured out how to get something for free and make a whole bunch of money off of it. There's this funny little paragraph in here. It says, before Fender Watch, information sharing between different police departments could be a cumbersome task. I got I right off the like, is this 1950? Police from different jurisdictions would have to call each other or physically meet to compare notes. Seriously? You have to compare notes to so like, hey, uh, uh, Officer Larry, can uh, can can I drive up to your district tomorrow and can we compare notes about this John Doe? Like there, there's these things like, hey, there's this internet thing. They could, come on, really? They can't share notes better than calling, which I know you love, but physically meet? That's ridiculous. <laughs> that's abs- that's really absurd. That's really disturbing to me. Like, we have email. I know it's a bunch of tubes, but it kind of works. 
So I've heard I've heard of that, Andy. I've heard that it. Works. Oh my God, it's it's really bizarre. All right, let's uh, let's hit this main feature, and we can cover a little bit about the Reason Magazine article. Just uh, if if you want to like read the I won't I won't say the dumbed down version, but the uh, Cliff Notes version. Let's call it that. Is the Reason article, and then we have the actual uh, PDF with the the decision, the Dove versus Marshall out of Alabama. This is good news. You people ask for good news. This is good news, and we got a good news thing because someone filed a challenge. Imagine that. Take it away. I know, right? This is from February 11th, so this is uh, like hot off the press five days ago. Uh, yes, it's a it's a it's a great decision. I'm still it's a lengthy uh, read, so and it's from a from a, a federal district court, middle district of Alabama. So it'd be very surprising if it were not appealed. It would likely be <laughs> appealed uh, by the state of Alabama. Uh, but uh, and I've invited Janice Bellucci for those of you who know, and she was not a, not around this weekend, but. I'm hoping we can get her on maybe next weekend to talk more about it. She's a expert in compelled speech, which which is right. one of the things that that's asserted and that was actually uh, one of the prevailing claims. But the, the the there were a number of claims asserted in this in this challenge, and most of them failed for various reasons. But the the uh, the surviving claims that didn't fail was the Alabama has decided to mark on the driver's license uh, uh, with big red letters. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Sexual uh, predator or sexual offender? What did they say it says? They, uh, uh, criminal sex offender. Criminal sexual offender. Yeah, and uh, uh, that is that is compelling an individual to carry a message, and that message that individual would probably choose not to carry. Very few people, I'm sure, <laughs> would volunteer to carry that on their driver's license. And the government can mark documents. I've said that on this on this podcast. But the documents that are marked, there, there are limits to everything that the government can do. And marking a license of an underage person to hopefully deter them from purchasing alcoholic beverages when they're not old enough to make it easier for the average citizen who might be in retailing and for the average law enforcement officer in our state, they're, they're sideways, they're vertical until the person reaches reaches 18, uh, 21, excuse me, they're, they're, they're vertical. Well, that's that's acceptable because it's for a narrow purpose uh, of, of 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 aiding law enforcement. But this criminal sexual offender is pretty pretty significant in terms of the impact it has on the person's life. So so the the court said that that was facially unconstitutional. You just can't do it. And uh, uh, Janice will be able to take it away because we're looking at a similar challenge in the state of Georgia. Yes. Not, not for driver's licenses, but for signs no. that, the, that the sheriff's departments in two counties erected on Halloween. And there again, that was forcing a, a, the, to, to come, uh, carry a message that people would probably choose not to have a sign in their yard uh, on Halloween. And, uh, and, and they so, – so I'm looking forward to getting into compelled speech more deeply in the, in the coming episode. But then the uh, – the internet usage uh, reporting requirement also was stricken because of, because of, of the broad overreaching un- lack of clarity in terms of what has to be reported uh, under Alabama law, and uh, so there's 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 two provisions that have been stricken from from uh, the unconstitutional in Alabama. You would you would have to uh, go if you went into a McDonald's to use Wi-Fi. If you borrowed somebody's phone to go look up an address or something like that, you would have to report both of those events back to your handlers. Which is absurd. Like well, you just go, like you go into McDonald's and you place an order and you use their Wi-Fi to place your order, and you have to tell your handler that you used Wi-Fi at McDonald's. Well, that's what it says. This judge repeatedly, at least two or three times, called them out of the state of Alabama on their disingenuous litigation strategy, their obfuscation, and their misrepresentations, which is kind of rare for a judge to do that. But uh, on that, on the part about the internet uh, uh, requirements, it says the act is far-reaching. A defender must report to police every time he connects to a Wi-Fi spot at a new McDonald's, every time he uses a new computer terminal at a public library, every time he borrows a smartphone to read the news online, and every time he anonymously collects comments on a news article. Every time he walks into a new coffee shop, he must determine whether opening his laptop is worth the hassle of reporting. The act is not limited to unlawful internet activity. To the contrary, just as the act burdens, uh, burdens sending child pornography and soliciting sex with minors, it also burdens blogging about political topics and posting comments online uh, regarding news articles. 
so uh, uh, this is this is good stuff. The, uh, here's here's what here's one of the quotes. Uh, the state argues that if a sexual predator is changing online identities and email addresses so often that it becomes a burden, one must wonder why he's going through such efforts to change his online identity. And the 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 the, uh, the court says normal internet usage would not require so many different. No, this is a, the the state saying that normal internet usage it says would not require so many different online identities that, uh, that then re, uh, and that reporting would be wouldn't be such a burden. But the argument has several flaws. One is that it incorrectly assumes that the act applies only to sexual predators. Not every right. offender is a predator, and the state poisons the well, which is the judge calling them out, and the state poisons the well by implying otherwise. <laughs> and, 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 and so, so like I say, the judge, the judge is, is letting the state have it for, for their litigation tactics. There's also another little block. It says, uh, it brings together uh, most of the restricted features used by other states, adds new restrictions, and punishes mild, minor violations with uh, years in prison. I was, I was, I thought I was reading the section that said that it is uh, the the Alabama one is the worst in the nation. It says no oh, other state says, system comes close. Yeah. As a, a sorcna a s o r c n a, which is the Alabama Sex Offender Registration and Community Notification Act. <gasps> Uh, it says no other state system comes close as applies to adult offenders, no matter where or uh, when or where they live when they were convicted. It bans people from living or working within 2000 feet of a school daycare or even if the offender has never harmed a child between 1030 p.m. and 6 a.m. No offender can be in the same house as a minor niece or nephew, not even for a minute. Wow. I, I, does, do you think that this is worse than, uh, than Florida does? <laughs> uh, well, uh, that the case that we've talked about, uh, people don't remember, uh, uh, but it's uh, handled by an attorney named Mitch McGuire, and it's, uh, it's regarding his brother, which is still pending in the 11th Circuit, where this case will ultimately end up as well. Uh, he, he did vast amount of research, Mr. McGuire did, and, and he was convinced that Alabama's was the most onerous and debilitating sex yeah. offender registration scheme. And, Seems and like I it. think I think I remember reading this opinion that the judge borrowed from that case and uh, used, used some of the information that was accepted by the court as factual in terms of how debilitating Alabama's registration requirements are. You have, to get civil. A tra- you, have to, you have to get a travel permit, not with your own supervision, but just to, to be away from your own home. <laughs> That's funny. <sighs> Uh, um, and then back to the compelled speech, there was a uh, significant comparisons to the license plate stuff in Vermont, I believe Connecticut, excuse me. And they have live free or die. And there was a, there was a challenge there that it's, it's almost hard to live in a, in an American society without a car. So therefore you would have to have this license plate with that message on it. And that would be compelled speech. Same as having it on your driver's license, you like. I think even in this law, it says that you can't use another form of ID. You might be able to use a passport, but a passport comes with some pretty heavy charges. And uh, so again, we're back to compelled speech. They compared to some other states that use some other kind of code on it that would be a little bit more obscure, not in big bold red letter "sex offender" on it. Uh, they could have gone to a more benign way of marking the driver's license, but they chose not to, which brings me to Oklahoma. Oklahoma just did that in the last handful of years that this would then be all of the casework for them to make a challenge in Oklahoma. Except the challenge in Oklahoma has already been made and lost. That's the only problem. Oh, never, <laughs> never mind. I thought I had a novel idea. <laughs> yeah. The, there was a pro se guy who made the challenge and he lost. The oh, oh, so the, oh, pro oh. Se litig- the pro se litigants always screw us. Almost ah. always, not always. Interesting. Interesting. Um, the, I, you know, until I got involved, I, I never, you know, everyone thinks of free speech. Like I can say what I want, but it, I, I'd never heard that the government cannot force you to speak, speak. And it also is a freedom to receive information. Not that that's related to this, but I never, I never considered those like a three legged stool of what freedom of speech means. Um, but I never considered that the government can't make you say something either, which I guess is the right to remain silent. I guess that's what that one is too. Yes. The constitutional um, harm 
Let's read from the opinion. And what the First Amendment prohibits is being forced to speak rather than to remain silent. And the harm does not turn on whether the speech is ideological, factual, or something else. And that's citing a Tenth Circuit case from uh, 2004. Uh, but but uh, this is going to be great stuff, and it'd be fu fun to have Janice on to go a lot deeper into uh, compelled speech, and then, and then hopefully we can chat a little bit about what we're going to do in your peach state. In That'll be fun. That'll be good. Because, That'll be good because people people want to hear some good news. Now, this is not bringing the registry down in Alabama. This will not bring the registry down. But I can guarantee you this: it will make people's lives a whole lot better. If they're not having to conduct their day-to-day -day affairs with sexual offender in red letters on their driver's license, yes, it, 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 it will improve their quality of life. It'll still be a very debilitating registry requirement in Alabama. There were some of these challenges, uh, uh, claims that were that were did not pan out because it, uh, in most cases either the, the plaintiffs dropped out of litigation or they didn't have standing. They, 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 there was claims about the, uh, the the familiar relationships being disrupted, and and the the court said, well, you are actually prohibited from living with those particular people because they're in exclusion zone. So therefore, it's not the 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 registry uh, prohibition that you can't be with a minor. It's the the, the uh, people want to have, for example, get married to somebody who has a kid already. The Alabama right. law won't let you do that, and arguably Jesus. under the um, decision loving versus virginia i think it is from back in the 1960s where where it, it was established that you can you can get married to anybody you want to theoretically that should apply here but mm -hmm. that wasn't that wasn't the issue they lit, litigated uh, they they were they they had two two things that were preventing them and the court said well you even if you could marry and live or, or cohabitate with that person you couldn't live there anyway because you're prohibited but the, but those those claims can come back in a, in, a, in, a, in another day. Uh, Alabama may 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 be in for some tough sledding if the Eleventh Circuit happens to affirm these two decisions uh, that that were made because McGuire took a little a little cheek out of it uh, with 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 his challenge that you had to get a travel permit you had to register both the city and the county and so they they struck the fact in McGuire uh, in, the, in, in the McGuire case that you don't have to register both the city and the county that that was definitely too onerous. Well, if they take off the ID requirement and they take off the internet reporting requirements that you that you that you have to report within how many hours was it of establishing a new identity? It was quick. <laughs> so you've taken another cheek out of the armor. Then the, see, then you're beginning to build momentum where the courts are questioning how far right. this so-called regulatory scheme can go, and the courts may chip away at the next person that comes on has good solid legal standing that could actually live in an exclusion uh, could be living with the person they're not in an exclusion zone for example and they are not being able to to cohabitate with someone who has a child they may take that chink out of it and they take another chunk of this and another chunk of this it's not the answer people are looking for but it's progress right let me ask you like in this decision there are sightings to cases all over the place and I don't want to. I don't want to be naive and say obviously, like an attorney did this, but did an exceptional attorney do this, or is this like what an attorney does? Do you think that the the does they did their research to bring in all these references? How did this go about to find all of the different sightings to the Packingham case and all the other things to support the uh, what the, what the judge wrote here? Well, the the attorneys largely provided the the now, but the federal courts have very good. Uh, 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 law clerks. They they pay good money, and they have the best. So if you're a federal judge, your law clerk is going to be unless you're just a a, a a joke of a judge. You don't know how to hire, but you 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 have the capacity to hire a good law clerk. But largely, this is put in the pleadings. When the judge decides which way they're going to rule, they're if they're ruling for the state, they're going to they're going to rely on more they, their citations. If they're ruling for the for for the other side, they're going to pick more. The, so so the the attorneys on the Marshall side they provided all this in the briefing that led up to, if you look at that, when they, when they say document number uh, all throughout this, you can see over a hundred documents were filed in this case. And if you went on Pacer, cause I say like on, 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 on page uh, on where it says no three and no seven, like, like standing doc, they refer to document number 140. Okay. So that, that tells you that a lot of documents have been filed in this case. So if you went on Pacer and looked, 
this this case has been going for for years, and there yeah, again, that's, it's three ish. That, that's where the legal bills are are devoured. Right. And right. and th- this this attorney is going to win a significant, if not all of his his or her legal fees back as a prevailing party, yeah. assuming that the Eleventh Circuit doesn't gut this decision. Okay. And just based on the uh, the Michigan thing, Miriam Ackerman and the ACLU up there, it was one and a half million ish, some some kind of number in that ballpark. I'll, 1. I'll just 8, assert yeah, one point eight. Okay, and, and that was all the way through the appellate process. Okay, and so we could just guess that it's in that ballpark. This is not as complex of a case, I don't think, but we could. It could be significant. It and could be in the high sixes or low seven. It could be. It could be a million dollar a case before it's all said and done. Uh, but but uh, this. But that doesn't deter Alabama. I mean, they 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 will continue to fight. <laughs> mm, unbelievable. Um, and and then we could throw the conservative argument out there again. It's like you have already been told that this is not a viable strategy. Stop spending the money. Pull back. Right. You could do that, but they seldom do. <laughs> Well, my God, I'm gonna cl- I, I, put, I put my hand on that Bible, and I am going <laughs> to defend the laws of this state. As long as I have air to breathe, I'm going to do what the people of this state like to me to do. But you and were told, the- but you were told to not do that. You like this is not a valid law. You were told to stop with this law. I was told by a federal judge as it pertains to these plaintiffs. The federal judge is not the end. I've got the Court of Appeals, and I've got the Supreme Court, and I don't have to stop until I'm told by the highest tribunal in this land. And we haven't been Mm. told yet. And by golly, I'm going to keep going. That's what the people told me to do when they elected me. (sighs) I do want to close this out. The the conclusion has a really – to me, it's an astounding statement by the judge. It says, Alabama can – actually, and, and one of those I have to attribute to you, too. So he's totally copying your quotes in here. Alabama can prosecute sex offenders to the full extent of the law. It can also act to protect its citizens from recidivist sex offenders. But the state denies that – whatever those letters are – is designed to punish offenders. And once a person serves his full sentence, he enjoys the full protection of the Constitution. That's your quote. Sex offenders are not second-class citizens, and anyone who thinks otherwise would do well to remember Thomas Paine's wisdom. He that would make his own liberty secure must guard even his enemy from oppression, for if he violates this duty, he established a precedent that will reach uh, to himself. And that is from 1795. I love it. uh, But but yes, when you've paid your debt to society, if you frame it that way, you win because even conservatives, and I think this is a conservative judge. I heard when someone say, I haven't done any research, but someone said that on something I was listening to, uh, uh, one of the comments uh, or read. But but anyway, if you if you believe in the Constitution, you pay your debt to society. It may be a harsh debt. It may be a lenient debt. But when it's paid, you're restored or or so we claim. That's what they say, isn't it? Yep, and you should be allowed to live your life. And they say, well, what would we do if we didn't have the sex offender registry? This is a question that gets posed to me. What do you propose in the alternative? And I say it pretty straightforward and simple. We do like we do with any other crime. If they offend again, we prosecute them and lock them up again. And probably with more. With more. Yes, but, but that's what we do. We allow them to resume normalcy until they offend again, and then we intervene again. That's what we, we do. Can- we can make the assumption that George W. Bush, being a Republican president, appointed a Republican, t- a person with conservative leanings to the judiciary, and that he was appointed in 05, I believe it was? Yes. So we can assume that he's on the conservative side of the opinion scheme. You're talking about the Alabama f- federal judge on the, the, this case? Yeah. Honorable W. Keith Watkins is the one yes. that presided, uh, that made this decision, and he was appointed by Bush in 05. Well, a true a true conservative, if they didn't contort themselves, they would actually come down to exactly the way he did. But see, the problem with true conservatives is they do, they 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 vacillate so much on what they actually do believe, and they contort themselves in positions to justify inconsistent uh, inconsistency. You know, it's like I mean, we talked about it before the you know the budget deficit ballooning. You know, they 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 have poor budget deficits except for when they have power, and then magically they become okay when they have power, and they run them up every single time. <laughs> so, so, uh, and 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 they they claim to be the power that the the party that keeps government off your back, but they can't 
increase government intervention fast enough when they're in power. They created the TSA. They created the Homeland Security. I mean, they created the Patriot Act. I mean, on and on and on. I can name things that they create that intrude in our lives, but they say that they're the party of keeping government out of your lives. It's, it's amazing. We're going to have to shut this down before we run off all the remaining listeners. <laughs> so... All righty. Well, we had we had our guest a few weeks ago. He explained it to me that that uh, it's okay to do those things because it's for the national security. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. But if it's in the interest of not what your party is interested in, then it's not okay. Okay, that's the definition of hypocrisy, I think. So. All right. Well, Larry, I I so very much appreciate you coming. I appreciate the Patreon people. Visit registrymatters.co to uh, to listen to the podcast if you want to stream it. Uh, call in, leave voicemail messages like you heard tonight at 747-227-4477. Shoot an email message at registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And of course, as always, the best way to support the podcast, even at a dollar a month, is patreon.com slash registrymatters. Come join in on a Discord server, hang out, have conversations, listen to the live stream. And that's all I got. Well, thanks, Andy. And when you're in Discord, we can actually talk back to you and we can take your question live. That would be super duper fun. We record generally around seven o'clock on a Saturday night. If you want to come hang out. Oh, well, hope you have me back again sometime, Andy. I, I might. I'll, I'll, I'll see about inviting you next week. All right. <laughs> Take care, Larry. Have a great night and a great weekend. Good night. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.